um, Praful and Martin. Can you hear me okay? Sure. Excellent. Hi, good, good morning, afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon. So we'll just wait a couple of minutes before um, everyone can join. A few more people just joining now. It's good to actually see because we start in at 11 o'clock UK time compared to the afternoon in our last session. So we're now seeing um, a number of people from the Middle East and Asia joining our session today, which is great. Um, unfortunately, a few people from the US are not able to join. So it's quite hard to get the time right, but um, it's lunchtime for you, Martin, in, in the Netherlands. It is, it is. <laughs> so we might hear your belly rumbling, rumbling <laughs> over the next No, time. no, I did some, made some precautions. So I, I had already a bit of a, a short lunch, or <laughs> a small lunch, yeah. yeah. Good, good. Okay, so it looks like we are, yes, a few more people. So we've already got a good 70% joining. So that's great. So maybe we should start. Okay, so thank you for joining CUI over coffee. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening, where, wherever you are. And um, we, 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 we put together the CUI over coffee series um, with the aim to bring together people across the asset integrity management community to promote discussion, uh, share insights and, and collaborate. And um, it was certainly, it was a great success, uh, season one. And uh, we've already had um, our first session for season two few weeks ago. So it's wonderful also to um, see Praffel again on our panel and uh, Martin Kramer. Hi, Martin. Hi. Okay, so we, um, we organized eight online sessions last season. And one of the key takeaways from, from those sessions is that we, within our corrosion and insulation community, we need to uh, think holistically about the problem. And that means us collaborating more and also thinking um, or addressing CUI from a, a systems perspective. So there's not one silver bullet. I think we all recognize that. And it was good for us in the season one to really understand what is the problem we're trying to address. Season two, we now have the opportunity to look, look from our silos, which we all work, typically work in and look outside and understand within our ecosystem, What's been done about uh, CUI uh, and the problem? And who can we start to think about engaging with? And certainly within our roles, who can we engage with in, within our own organization, be it the IoT department, instrument, instrumentation team? We need to start thinking holistically. So I'm really pleased to um, welcome our, our guest from Yokogawa. And um, it might be useful, Martin, for you to quickly introduce yourself and Yokogawa, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for the invite to be here. So my name is Martin Kramer. I'm um, residing in the Netherlands, uh, where the head office of uh, Yokogawa Europe is. Um, Yokogawa is a, a big company in the um, oil and gas and chemical industry automation uh, business. So we have our control system, SCADA systems, MIS layer, and, and other things as well. Um, recently, we've added there also an IoT solution on top of that. Um, we will look a bit more on that uh, uh, later on as well. Um, and my role is a consultant uh, in, in uh, mainly the MIS area, the integration area, etc. Okay, thank you, Martin. And Praful, I think it'd be wise for me to let you introduce yourself. There's some people new to the call today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Praful, Praful Sharma, um, uh, CTO of uh, Corrosion Radar, and excited to champion the cause of uh, CUI community, the asset integrity community, bringing latest solutions, smart industrial IoT solutions to solve their needs. Thank you. No, I'm excited about this um, debate yeah. and it's good to have Praful yourself coming in from a CUI angle and, and Martin coming from a, an automation angle. So it's good to have you. And, then, and the topic of today, you'd be pleased to know is CUI, an integrated data approach. Now, um, this is building on the last session that we had a few weeks ago with uh, TAMPnet and LTI, which was about the rise of connected sensors. And there was a lot of interest in, in, in this. And uh, 
And what, what's very clear is that, you know, there's lots of discussion about capturing data and, 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 and we're doing a lot of work now around it in, and in the digitalization space. But I think there's still a lot of people um, looking at ways to do something with that data. And, and, and so I think, you know, the key of, uh, of today is certainly, you know, how can we um, make use of data, not just in our own silos, but data within the organization or within the ecosystem. And this was a key topic at the Future of Oil and Gas um, conference earlier this week. Um, there was a recognition that there's a lack of sharing the data, there's a lack of collaboration, and that we're all still working in our silos. So it'd be good to um, talk about that through, through our session. And it'd be good to um, go into um, some housekeeping, general housekeeping, and then the first question. So in terms of um, how we're going to spend the next uh, 50 minutes, we probably spend a good 30 minutes on the topic. Um, and um, we, we typically um, break it down into three areas, you know, provide some context, go into some detail, and then look at some practical examples. We will run a poll too at the start, and then come back to the poll results. And then at the end, we'll do a Q&A for about 15 minutes. We will record the session. Um, it will make it available on YouTube afterwards as well. Um, but we also encourage you to um, and post your questions throughout the session. So I think we all should um, get started. And have you got your coffee, Martin and Praful? Sure. Excellent. And um, again, in, in Holland, I always ask this question, what do you actually drink in Holland? Is it mainly coffee drink or tea? A lot of coffee and strong coffee. Strong coffee, yes. <laughs> but coffee, not cappuccino. So, not, okay, uh, so it's yeah. coffee in the UK is weak for you then, is it? <laughs> Very good. What they say, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So let's get started with the first question. Um, and we like to open up with a question that just provides some context. To, to the discussion. And before we do that, we've also just put our poll um, live, so for you to see, and um, you can see the questions in front of you now. So whilst we are talking about um, the opening question, you know, feel free to um, answer the polls. The, the first question is your typical question in terms of where do you sit in the industry. Um, the, the second question is an interesting uh, question in terms of data integration and um, it'd be good for you to first of all um, for you to just answer this poll and we can then go to the next questions on the second poll okay now let's let's start with the lead question so we've been talking about data integration for a long long time I know I've done some work with IBM in the past and there was lots of technology being brought out in, in, in the uh, in the 90s associated with services bus, um, data warehousing, uh, middleware portals, and, and now cloud. So we've been doing data integration for a long time. So what, what actually has been working well or not working well? And um, you know, what is it that we're trying to do now differently to what we were doing in the past? Maybe, maybe Praful, if I start with you, and if you could um, share your views on, 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 on this particular question. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I think uh, on this question, um, I think I, I will represent this UI community here. So this corrosion and insulation have been a major issue and, and we see a lot of advancements in a parallel domain in the automation. Um, how these two things comes together and benefit the end user with a structured data. So that's what I think I'm looking forward to the discussion today with Yokogawa on how the structured data approach can benefit the asset integrity community, starting with CUI as a big use case. So uh, that's, my, that's my take on, on the issue around a structured or unstructured data which is prevalent in the asset integrity. So just so I'm clear, Praffle, is the, the, is the issue with, are we trying to grapple with the unstructured data and structured data is, is, is easy? Uh, what, I mean, what's your view on that? Well, I think uh, there's structured data exists, but not for asset integrity, I would say. I mean, there are some industries which we see are more uh, advanced than the others. 
of course oil and gas is uh, advanced in, but many of the practices around especially asset integrity are still manual there are still data which are data silos uh, and now there is an opportunity to use what automation industry have always been doing to store the data in a very structured way but at the same time um, bring it in a cost effective way as well to the to the desk the data to the desk and, and i think that's what we are looking at as to how we can bring that data to the desk in a very structured way because the benefits are huge it's not only about data it's also about analytics which which we will talk here okay okay thank you prafal let's quickly just share the results of the first poll so we know who's in the audience and where they sit okay so thank you for sharing this as typically we we do see a large majority in the offshore um, upstream or onshore industry uh, but still there's a good handful of people in the refinery and petrochemical areas um, and these are obviously industries that Yokogawa and Martin you, uh, you serve and call, call to your business. Um, very interesting that we, yeah, we, we started to see more people joining from Asia Pac because of the time, so that's great, and Middle East, and, and, and yeah, a good handful of people from Africa, so that's great. Thank you. So um, whilst um, I'm going to ask Martin the, um, this question, it might be also worth us running the poll question so that we can ask the audience um, those questions early and we can come back to it those 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 questions and answers and re results um, as we as we go along so martin we spoke about data integration i'm sure you're tired of talking about data integration i mean you know what's new and what have you learned from the past <laughs> yeah um of course we, we uh, discussed this a bit before so i prepared a few slides um, the last two years, I spent a lot of time in the IAOT and fourth industrial revolution side. Uh, but you tend to reflect what has happened in the past and how does it translate to the future. So let me run you through a few slides which reflect my thinking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Is that visible? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, so basically, I, there's a lot of buzz in the market that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. And what are the drivers there? It's uh, like smart sensors, uh, like uh, corrosion radar creating, maybe edge devices, um, a lot of me methodologies for network uh, connection, low power, high power, high capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, typically, everything is stored in the cloud. Um, cloud is, is limitless, so to say, in, in CPU power, in, in scalability. And then the data is enriched with data analytics. Those are the four drivers. But if we go one revolution back, the third revolution, you see automation, computers, and electronics. That is an era, um, 40, 50 years back, where Yokogawa uh, stepped in and started to create automation uh, solutions and, and created um, the data. So what happened in the third industrial revolution? So if we would move on. Um, we could started to create plants, uh, um, the steel, the pipes, um, things that can rust, et cetera, et cetera, the whole process. And we put an organization on top of that. And um, to control the plant, we got with the third industrial revolution, control systems. And then our organization, we split into, you could say, three levels. Uh, those which interact with the control system, do the day-to-day -day operations. Then we have what we would call an MIS or an operations management layer where your maintenance persons, your scheduling people, et cetera, reside. And then for the long-term business process, you have a fourth layer um, on top of that. We call that layer four. And each of them got their own software solutions. Yeah. And typically, if you would make it a bit more detailed, we would say that on the, on the level two, where your control system is, the data is captured from your sensors. Um, it's typically placed in a data historian. And then on top of that, we've seen multiple silos uh, start to develop more on the scheduling side or on the operation side, the maintenance side or the production side with all their own um, packages. Um, so we got vertical data basically, um, also moving to the top side to do your billing, to do your um, um, warehousing, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been struggling the last decades to integrate between these type of applications. Uh, you see more movement in the market. The idea is not new. Even in the 90s, we had um, theories how to do that. But in my personal um, uh, experience, companies still struggle a lot to have integration even between different silos. 
now we get industry 4.0 and what then basically happens is that besides the existing side, um, OT and, and um, MIS and, and layer 4 data stream, we get new sensors, we get new data streams, we get new um, outputs and then we have to start thinking of another, yet another integration. Yeah. So you were asking me if I was tired of all the integrations. Um, I find it a very nice challenge to handle, but the challenge is only getting bigger in my opinion. Okay, so you yeah. actually, you see with the, the, the rise of digitalization, there is, and I like this term that I learned from an operator last year, they called it the, the acts of digital vandalization. Um, or um, they also use the term digital fatigue. You know, a lot of companies are getting tired of all these different digital initiatives that are going on, which is great, but it's causing, from my understanding, lots of technical debt and, and complexity. Um, and um, this is interesting that you talk about um, you know, how data has been generated in silos within organizations, and maybe now we need to start thinking about, well, how do we um, join, join the dots within our own organizations, let alone the ecosystem. And, uh, and it's an interesting topic, uh, Martin, because in, uh, as part of the Future Oil and Gas Conference earlier this week, um, Dassault Systems made the point that when it comes to business transformation, the trouble is a lot of technology companies are pushing their, their, their features and benefits and, 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 and at a, a siloed level. And, and the trouble is when it comes to trying to transform a business, you need to look at the business processes and, and, and be able to understand if you can understand how the business processes work and can be streamlined and integrate better, then that will help you then determine how data is um, stored and, and integrated. So you know, what, what's your view on that, uh, Martin? Just um, yeah. Flipping that back to you. Just, just observing at uh, companies we interact with, um, I think you see that basically two, two approaches. One is the central approach that's from, from top level, that is mentioned. Okay, we have to come to an integrated approach. Um, so we have to make a roadmap, uh, a structure, an architecture that we get um, a completely integrated system. So for example, on, on, the, on, on this level, you could start to use uh, middleware or other things and that you align business processes with each other um, and then connecting the business through the silos, through that data integration. Um, I think this is a bit easier with new plants, but in our area of the world, there are not so many new plants. So to do it in an existing uh, industry um, needs a lot of effort and a lot of drive from the top uh, to make it happen. Yes. The other approach I see happening is, is that um, it starts to happen between individual silos. But some people agree, okay, we have to make this more efficient. Can we make an integration between permit to work and the CMS system, um, or maybe the operations management system or the asset performance management system. And then it's more on, on um, yeah, maintenance at the operations head level, so to say. Uh, I, I see both happening, yeah. And I think this, okay. this reflects also in, in uh, what's happening with IoT, but, but more on that later, yeah. Okay, so that's, um, I think you made, you made a very good point in terms of if you're going to really drive business transformation, it needs to be mandated and, and sponsored from the top down. And you need to have your advocates across the different business silos in order to you know, make sure that everyone's aligned with the, you know, from an integration point of view. Uh, so we're talking about joining the dots. Um, this is the thing, or connecting the dots. It's, it's a common phrase now. Um, and um, you know, that's all about integrating multiple data sources, technology, um, communication platforms, and visualization capabilities. So what does this all mean to you, Prafel, in the CUI world when it comes to joining the dots? Exactly. Thank you, James, and thank you, Martin. I think uh, connecting the dots and joining the dots is the, uh, is the very good word here because automation have always existed and asset integrity management have always existed. The two have not joined together traditionally, right? Now is the time we are talking about it now the new sensors have been getting developed. Um, if you talk about especially CUI, uh, CUI is a big use case of that, where sensors are getting developed, uh, the new philosophies have been getting developed because many, many other uh, methods have failed or not have produced better results. Like prevention is better than cure, but prevention is always not proven. Um, 
So CUI is still happening. So we need sensors and automation, how we can use the power of automation to bring a structured data to the, to the, to the user. And that too at a, at a much lower cost angle, which means we need to talk about uh, whether we can deploy the sensors at a much affordable um, point. Uh, say minimizing the industrial IoT, industry, industry four revolution, you know, um, this is becoming apparent then that new sensors can be deployed much easily at much affordable costs and the data comes to the uh, desk, bringing the power of automation to the asset integrity, right? And from manual methods to automated methods, having structured data in the plate and use that data to even an, do analyze and do RBI, risk-based, uh, do analytics predictions, a huge opportunity with asset integrity. Okay, well, thank you, yes. Prafo. And I think we, we did this, um, you may have some bandwidth issues. So um, I'm sure if you can boost your signal, <laughs> but, um, uh, What's interesting, Prafel, in terms of what you mentioned, um, and I'm going to come on to you, Martin, about this, is it's all well and good us talking about um, the structured data and generating that within our asset integrity world. Um, and then that data then goes and, and is connected to the IoT world. But um, is IoT the opportunity or is it a problem? Because um, how, do, how, how, are we, how are we integrating data back from and, and between IoT and operational technologies and surely it's always it's, um, the, the question is never the technology it's always the business value uh, <laughs> if business value, then there should be a way to do it <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that it, that is uh, when, when you talk to a lot of technical people this will be about the technical nitty-gritties and if you talk to security people it will be about the security nitty-gritties but in the end what is the value to the business eh? and I think to have integrations um, can bring you a lot of value if you do it the correct way. Um, and that's, I think, always the question. Um, what does this solution bring? Um, will it run nicely on its own? Or does it bring additional value by integrating it? Um, if you like, again, I have a, a number of slides prepared, a little bit how uh, we look at it at Yokogawa. OK, thank you. Yeah. So share my screen. Good. Um, uh, in Yokogawa, we created an IoT platform, we call it Join. Uh, <laughs> I like, I like it. Joining join. the dots, but yeah, <laughs> we call it Join. And Join has something of openness in it. And, and that's one of the things we strongly believe in. Um, it's not just a Yokogawa only uh, solution. Um, we think that openness is something that the market now is looking for. So we use corrosion radar sensors. We use our own SUSI sensor. We use other third party sensors. Um, the same on network, on cloud, and on analytics. And um, with the data we capture in this way, we uh, enrich it with the uh, algorithms. Uh, we typically focus on predictive and prescriptive uh, algorithms. And then uh, talking about the business value or the value, um, depending on, on the, the topic we are uh, connecting, it can be in the area of maintenance. Um, I have, I think, a nice example of that uh, later on. But it can also be in uh, health and safety and operations, in energy, labor, etc. I think every time the concept is a kind of similar, you have some data capturing devices, sensors, uh, you have a way to get it in, you would store it in the cloud, you run your analytics out of it, and then it, uh, the idea is to bring value with the analytics. Um, and then, of course, the question comes, how do you integrate that? Um, mm. I have to go a bit to a technical level now. I'll go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, this is how we present it to our customers, uh, who we interact with. Uh, so basically, we say we have sensors uh, here. We're agnostic what type of communication we have. We're agnostic for the sensors we connect, uh, and it goes to our cloud. And then, of course, um, there are other things that have to be integrated. Can you integrate with my traditional OT domain to my data historian, my control system, or maybe to my PLC? So yes, that's possible. We, we put an edge box uh, there. Maybe you want to connect to a particular robot or something else. OK, other edge box. Um, and then data can be integrated uh, two ways. Um, many customers have their own cloud. Um, CR, for example, has their own cloud uh, where they run their analytics. So cloud-cloud communication is also something that is, is happening a lot. 
Um, so you see how, yeah, from the technical perspective here, integration is not really a problem in that sense. But if we take it more again to the business uh, um, side of things and, and what we see happening over the years. Um, here, more the traditional vertical uh, with the level two, level three, level four, and the statement that it's already quite a challenge to integrate nicely uh, here. And then IoT comes in and we get even more data. So um, basically what I also mentioned a bit before, I, I see two approaches to things. Um, there are companies who take it really from the sea level. So they say, we want a structured approach. And when we do things, we want to follow the right procedures, the right security, the right way of integration. And, and let's take the whole thing at one go. And that is nice and that's good. But there are a lot of companies where they say, I have this problem and I've heard about this nice sensor. Can we not just roll it out? Let's do a proof of concept and out of that start on. And that is another approach I see a lot. And um, so basically what then happens is, is that one solution maybe from corrosion radar, maybe something else is taken. And um, it runs in, for example, our cloud platform and people interact via the dashboard. And over time, um, the question runs, oh, can we integrate this? Yeah, that's possible. And then where do we integrate it? Do we integrate it into the cloud? Do we integrate it into your maintenance system? These are then discussions we will have. Um, so I see both approaches happening and, and I think it's really a per case. And I think I would not be the one to say that one is better than the other. Um, I, I feel that you should be doing things and improving things because that's what the business is, is requesting. Um, and don't wait too long in that sense. Yeah. You know, there's, it's interesting. You, uh, Prafo, I mean, if I throw it back to you in terms of some of the projects you worked on um, around integrating, um, in, the, in Corrosion Radar's case, uh, sensors for moisture and, and corrosion. Um, are you finding companies thinking about the, the ability to scale? Uh, and do you think they need to be really thinking about this upfront now as part of the, the, field, um, the, you know, the, the field deployments that they are working on at the moment? I mean, what's your view on this? I think what we find is, um, uh, you know, in the, in the end user community, like <clears throat> the plants and petrochemical refineries and upstream, they always uh, have this question about how do we start, right? Uh, and companies like Corrosion Radar, we always uh, have this uh, challenge about what is the starting point? So we normally do pilots, uh, start with the pilots um, for the most attractive use cases. And typically uh, it's a collaboration, it's, it's a joint workout as to be identified and user identify which are the most critical assets, very attractive use cases, start with the pilots. And then um, at the pilot stage, you don't want to invest a whole lot of money because at that stage, it's, it's more about proving the concept value, business value, technology as well. Um, so at that stage, we want to minimize the infrastructure cost to create wireless because the moment you say wireless data connectivity, people think, okay, we need to go big right from the start. But at the pilot stage, we can't afford to do that. So we have worked out ways in which data can be collected wirelessly even without a pilot allows a discussion as to how the scale up will look like. And that's where companies who provide infrastructure services like Yokogawa, like automation companies, they come in picture because that's the scalability at that point. Um, many times we find that the end users already have this vision of creating the infrastructure. Sometimes they do have infrastructure, sometimes infrastructure in the sense of industrial IoT, wireless infrastructure. But sometimes they don't have that. And of course, you know, small scale pilots without huge investments is always a good start. So that's, that's what my view is, James. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. And um, I think what it needs, um, and, What's really important is for companies like Yokogawa to be collaborating with third party um, technology companies and who provide additional sensors and, and really make it easy for their joint customers so that um, you're removing the barriers, you're moving the uncertainty, and you're starting you know, when you do even your first trial you're starting with the, um, with the end in mind and the ability to be able to scale in, in an effective way. 
So I think we're reliant on, um, on Martin, you joining the dots, not just from a data integration point of view, but from an ecosystem point of view too. Yeah, I was just thinking when you mentioned that, James, we have a slide where there's like um, a fish, which is Yokogawa, and there are like 20,000 fish behind, which are all small startups trying to do also data integration and, and providing um, um, a specific solution like, like Corrosion Radar. The market has really changed. There were before a company as Yokogawa really did the whole data integration up. There are a lot of companies providing now data and, and it's a big topic how to integrate that. Um, and that's why we embrace openness because we don't believe that Yokogawa will have all sensors. We think that there will be that many of those 20,000 fish will have great solutions. And the thing is that that has to be integrated. That's the key point. And that's what we yes. want to serve uh, our customers with. Yeah, yes. Not so much to have only the Yokogawa center and only the Yokogawa solution. So, I'm not going to come on to um, your sensors uh, shortly. I just want to say thank you. There's a lot of people already posting some questions in the in the chat box, so that's wonderful. We can we can come to that um, afterwards. We've also um, run our poll at the start. If you haven't um, um, responded to that, it'd be great for you to respond to the poll, and we'll um, share those results soon. Um, but uh, Martin, you mentioned about Yokogawa sensors, so and you mentioned fish. So can you explain to me wh who came up the, with sushi sensor? Yeah, that that was baked in uh, in Japan, I have to say. Um, so the sushi sensor is a is a small sensor which um, uh, measures acceleration and uh, um, velocity um, and uh, surface temperature. And typically, you can roll that out on rotating equipment like ventilators, motor pump combinations, etc. So the idea here is that it's, it's small, um, it uses LoRa communication, so the range is, is pretty um, longer, depending on, on the congestion uh, up to a few kilometers. Um, it has a battery that runs a long time, so it plays, basically you place it on your uh, motor or your pump or your van or whatever, and it will take a measurement, for example, every hour, uh, three times per day, whatever you put it in. Um, we collect the data, we create a model out of that, what like the fingerprint is of the normal behavior of that asset. And uh, when that fingerprint starts to change to, like the data we get in uh, changes to compare to, to the fingerprint, we raise an alarm. And that is then an, an, an indication you have to go. Um, I have another example later on, um, okay. how we did that with a different sensor. Of third maybe we, we come up, yeah. Maybe yeah. we get to the practical example very yeah. uh, uh, shortly. And, and Praffel, um, be interesting if um, Corrosion Radar came up with a similar naming, such as Sushi, and um, and uh, maybe that's a, a thought uh, for you to, to you know to have, a, have a think about. Uh, use, but, um, but, yeah, but but yes. specifically though, Praffel, yeah. So how do you see, from a CUI perspective, moisture and corrosion information being combined with other information such as vibration or um, temperatures? I think, uh, you know, that's where the opportunities are. Say, um, Martin mentioned about horizontalization of industry in the sense earlier vertical industries like automation companies like Yokogawa, they provided end-to-end -end solutions. But now what we see is that fish uh, analogy that uh, automation companies being the front angle of it, but there are many technology companies like Corrosion Radar are providing independent solutions. And the opportunity there is not only the inner, but to integrate with the other types of sensors. Specifically, what we are using as an example is corrosion data provides, say, corrosion moisture sensors for insulations. But when we combine it with sushi temperature sensors and the data is available on the cloud, a whole lot of analytics is possible with that, especially when a structured data is uh, available, right? So we talked about earlier unstructured data. Problem with that is, it does not allow analytics. Mm. But now when we have a structured data combined with other sensors data, temperature, that gives predictive abilities. Very simple example, right? If you detect water in an insulation and you have the temperature of that pipe, you can estimate the corrosion rate of that pipe uh, on the CY, right? Now that corrosion rate is a very useful parameter because that allows the end user to actually schedule their inspections three years, five years in advance, right? Yes. Uh, and that's the power of data integration. So that's my take. There are huge opportunities to combine data sets on the cloud. Yeah, it sounds Definitely. a great opportunity. So um, let's um, close the, 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 the um, chat soon. Um, 
but um, let's also just go through the poll results. So let's go to question one. Where do you see the biggest benefit in data integration? Now, I'm glad that we um, actually um, explained what CMMS is because, um, you know, certainly um, maybe it's not um, well known, but computerized maintenance management system. Um, and that seems to be the most popular answer, um, followed by performance management system and service provider system. I'm surprised about the answer, uh, the response with regards to service provider system, because maybe maybe um, there's a lot of operators in the audience, and they're thinking in terms of you know, how are they going to deal with the data. But surely um, there will be service companies who are providing additional value add services around inspection and maintenance that would be in a better position to, to provide, um, to, to, to actually benefit from that data integration. Um, but what's your view on this, Martin? Yeah, I think that that quite reflects what we see as well. Um, definitely the maintenance side is, is, um, is the, um, the, the major driver at this moment, I think on IoT. If I, say, I word that a bit wrong, but uh, um, I think most uh, attention goes into the CMS side of things. Um, from our personal experience, we are not integrating so much yet with CMMS systems, but I, I'm pretty sure over time that will happen because you want to know um, when you have to create uh, a work order uh, to, to do either uh, repairs or, or predictive maintenance or inspections or other things. So definitely, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. So that's the management whole system. business process integration we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. It is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, you also see more in the market that, that these type of systems go more into the cloud and cloud cloud integration is, is actually quite a bit easier than doing it on premise. Um, so I think those two um, combined will, will see uh, this happening. Yeah. Okay. So you talk about cloud and on premise. Um, are we yeah. able to share the, the results from the, the, the last poll? And whilst we do that, Prafel, have you got anything to add in regards to? Yeah, sure. Um, when we saw in the, the, that, that poll result, normally we see that we transition from one uh, type of data location to the other. So at the pilot stage, normally the, the end users are okay with, but for a scalability, they do prefer to integrate that data into the CMMS, right? Or, or their own systems. So it's a, it's a question about whether it's a pilot or is it a large scale deployment, production deployment. So the data resides according to that. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So we've just posted the um, questions. I thought we had already done that. So if you um, would like to respond to this question, please do. Um, and um, it will be interesting to see um, the answers from, from the last poll. So let's just move on to the, the final part because we always want to talk about practical examples. And what I was personally frustrated with at the Future Oil and Gas Conference, it was still very vague in terms of right, what, is, what, is, what is people doing about X, Y, Z. Um, so maybe I'll lean on you, Martin. Can you give us, um, share, share some good practical examples of uh, data integration and maybe um, then Pruffle can draw on that from a CUI perspective? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you an example of a project we did. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you. So I, I uh, mentioned before, I see two types of approaches. Uh, one is um, from, from sea level, very much managed and, and well planned out. And the other one is just start somewhere. So the example I have is more like start somewhere. At the same time, we are at the moment doing a project where everything is very nicely um, rolled out from the top. So um, at the moment, we are integrating data from our platform to their platform. Um, and that's in an all managed way. Um, this is a little bit different, but I think uh, it's a very nice use case and close to, to maintenance as well. Okay, Let me share you. my screen. So I'll run through it quickly. This is um, Tata in the Netherlands. It's a big steel company. Um, actually, we did a webinar together with them. So if you like, later want to look a bit more, it's in Dutch, but there is more information on the web as well. And they have huge machines uh, rolling steel. And uh, rolling means that things roll, need to be lubricated, that you have gearboxes, et cetera, et cetera. And they had big problems with um, the lubrication side of things. So much that they had uh, operators three times a day checking the, the lubrication lines, if the thing, the, the oil was uh, running or not. Um, and still often shutdowns happened and, and it um, was pretty costly, yeah. 
um, partly because there was a shutdown, but partly also, as you see on the pictures, that things just break down. Um, so Tata already invested quite a bit in, in um, IoT platform and, and were moving ahead in that area. At the same time, things were not going that fast. And um, the, the, the maintenance people um, in this area said, we need something quicker. So they decided to go the individual way and uh, they tied up uh, together with us. And uh, what we delivered was uh, a set of wireless sensors. So it was easy to roll out. Um, and basically we measured the temperature in the lubrication lines. Uh, and then we enriched that uh, with models to detect if, if something abnormal was happening. Because basically when oil is flowing, the temperature has a different profile than when the oil is not flowing. So in this way, we could uh, predict um, if something was going correctly or heading to the wrong direction on completely not flowing. So that had nice benefits for Tata. Um, of course, no people on site to uh, every shift to go around and check, but also that you can better predict when something is going wrong, better schedule it. Um, you're earlier getting a warning that something is wrong, so um, the amount of breakage in your machinery is also less. Cloning still ha help, uh, happens, so you still have to do your maintenance, but it's much easier to plan. Um, it was quite interesting. When we did the webinar, we, we learned a bit more about the return on investment. And they said, the investment we did is, is less than one failure. Yeah? And you can imagine if you have three times a day shift going around to check that the that, uh, failure rate was pretty high. Um, so I think this was a really nice case. And uh, Tata also thought that. And uh, we now have rolled out a second uh, set on, on other machinery. So I think it's a nice, simple example, um, what you can do, what the benefits are, and, and if you just start, uh, um, things start to move. We've not been talking integration yet. Um, as people are using the system now, they're talking, we want more alarms, we want a report. So you see gradually that the question to integration is coming. So uh, it, it may happen uh, somewhere uh, in the near future, we'll see. Uh, but basically we are ready for that. Um, but I think it's a nice example, yeah, how, how it process goes through the time. Yes, yep. yeah, and I'm sure, um, Prafel, you can relate to, to this case study. Um, there is a lot of synergy with um, companies wanting to um, address CUI um, from the point of um, optimizing inspection maintenance and reducing downtime. Yeah, a few points here. I think uh, vibrations, uh, which uh, is the early uh, use case of uh, connectivity and automation for, for maintenance. Uh, and now similar philosophies are coming to corrosion management um, as well, because corrosion have been a manual process. It's been, and traditionally people have lived with it because it's a slow corrosion development process. But now the problem is so huge that management of that is difficult unless we have um, uh, collated all the data available and prioritized. So I, I feel uh, definitely we're seeing that indication in the market that what happened with the vibration and industrial IoT use cases there are coming to asset integrity and corrosion management. Um, that, that's where we are standing for, yeah, James. Okay, that's, that's good to know. And, and, and um, yeah, I can see uh, Martin from the Yokogawa joint perspective, there's lots of synergy with um, CUI and, um, and what you're doing in, in regards to the vibration. Yeah, actually, we made an integration between, uh, between your cloud and our cloud, because uh, we see the, the value in that, yeah. Okay, so that, that I think that was one of the questions um, posed in the in the chat. Uh, what, what's Yokogawa doing about CY? Are you getting people knocking on your door saying, "I've got a problem with CY," and maybe expand <laughs> on that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a nice question as well, eh? because um, we are known as data integrators. We are not known as corrosion experts. Yeah. So uh, what I typically see with the smaller fish that they have to know the domain expertise and have more the entry from those questions. But then the question comes, what's the bigger perspective? And that's where we step in. Um, so the amount of, of people knocking on our door, do we have a corrosion uh, 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 solution for this? Is um, We have them, but it's not huge, so to say. But that also, I think, has to reflect a bit the domain knowledge we typically have. Yeah, and that's why, again, we think openness is important because with partnering, you create an ecosystem which covers a lot of things. And you should not necessarily have all the expertise in-house. But if your partners have that and work together, um, I think that is that's the strongest team. So the uh, data integration between cloud between cloud platform did that go well? I mean, is it is it straightforward? Yeah, 
yeah and that that's a continuous um, uh, uh, you know trend that uh, uh, for example corrosion data as a company they provide a solution as a pirate scale for their own cloud but at the larger scale uh, many times the customers are using yokogawa and other people's cloud so we use cloud to clouds data communication to enable integration into third dashboards which the customers are already using so, it's of course uh, um, true, companies huh? like us have to gear up for that yeah okay yeah. if you if you look at typical ot at the level two integrating between systems is such a pain maybe modbus no even with modbus you have many varieties and then you talk about opc and other communications but with with cloud clouds and the modern technologies things are much more on a higher level and integration typically is much easier and, and more straightforward and that's also the case here with corrosion radar i think we set it up very quickly Okay, excellent. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. So let's quickly wrap up in terms of the last poll, because uh, you spent, mentioned cloud a few times, and um, let's look at the answers or the responses. What is the preference in, in, to where inspection and maintenance data is held? So external cloud, the vendor's cloud, and on-premise, um, similar response, 19%, but the majority um, talk about um, private cloud. Now, this is interesting, actually, because um, at the Future One and Gas Conference, Johan Cleverson Shell uh, announced that you know, Shell are going to the public cloud um, with their systems, uh, which is a big move for oil and gas companies. But there's still, uh, I think, a lot of other companies still nervous about doing that. And private cloud, I'm not surprised, is, is um, a, a, a common way to um, store and, and host the data. Any, any thoughts on that, Martin and Papa? Yeah, um, I mean, I think a huge amount of people have uh, Gmail, uh, that, that is public cloud. Um, and a lot of other things are in public cloud. And um, the public cloud is used so much that they have put a lot of emphasis on security, on protection, on regulation, because if such a company makes a mistake, they lose a lot. Um, so in reality, I think the, the, the public cloud is a very robust solution. But um, our companies are often more traditional. I say, if it happened on premise, it's safe. Um, but that's, I think, nowadays um, not so true anymore because the amount of effort you have to put in to keep it safe, to maintain it, um, are pretty high. So it's a process which is happening, but you see more and more um, openness to think about external cloud or internal cloud, at least to the cloud. Um, and, and I think in the end, there will be a move to external cloud as well. But that, that okay. will take some time. Yeah. And then very quickly, Prafel, before we go to, because there's lots of plenty of um, plenty of questions that we need to Yeah, I mean, I agree with this uh, poll. What I can say is if we had done this poll five years back, the, I'm sure on-premise would have got more than 60-70%, right? That mm -hmm. was the understanding at that time. But now you can see the change. People are more comfortable with large companies are moving towards internal cloud. But there are small plant operators who are still reliant on external cloud or on-premises. So it's a mix always, yes. uh, but definitely internal cloud. Yeah. Is okay, excellent. So thank you. Um, and I think it's a good um, you know, end to the, the discussion. And um, it's, um, it's interesting seeing some of the questions come through. So plenty of good questions. So maybe we start going through these now. Um, Stephen Tate, hi Stephen, thanks for joining from Total. Uh, Prafo and Martin's early comments within Total Digital Factory, it all seems to be moving towards mobile apps rather than desk based data access. So, what's your view on that, Martin? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm not a big expert in this. Um, I see the move to apps, definitely. Um, for example, with, uh, with maintenance systems. Um, but I also have seen some people doubting it. And um, I am not the big expert to say that completely the trend will go this way or that way. Mm. Uh, but if you look at the younger generation, everything happens with apps. Um, so maybe the resistance I've seen in the past is more with older people, whereas with the young people, there's probably no question and everything will go there. But this is my two cents, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And, and Prafu, have you come up with a mobile app where you can um, look at your um, assets and equipment and check whether everything is fine or if there's signs of moisture and corrosion? 
I think it's a good angle. At the moment, uh, yes, desk, the data to the desk is the big angle. Um, and it's not too difficult to bring data to the mobile. Uh, and I think uh, what uh, Total is mentioned on their hand in the field. That's where the power of mobile apps is. Yeah. Um, I think we are getting there. Okay, excellent. Okay, so thanks for that. Gino, good, oh, good to see you on the call, Gino. Even in a new plant, integrating sensors to keep track on the plant health is not easy since project managers don't care what happens with their project after starter. Yes, that is the challenge. They only care about their budget and these systems are mostly kicked out to save their budget. So uh, I suppose yeah, when it comes to the business case, there needs to be alignment and um, certainly with the projects and operations teams. I know companies like BP are doing a lot of work around integrating projects with operations. And, and of course you have operations people representing um, the, the projects. And um, again, I think, have you seen this Martin, the, the challenge with, um, you know, from a business case point of view and budgets, uh, companies are still cutting corners and not thinking about the long term and, and the holistic approach to no no okay good um, i think it, again it comes back to the business value How, yeah. what value does it bring for you and it's interesting we have quite a bit of use cases i just showed you one but uh, something that comes back repeatedly is that you have much less people running on your plant um and that can be a very valid business case um for a lot of people like in europe we have a lot of retirement so a lot of experienced people go out it's difficult to get new people um so yeah if you can reduce the amount of work people have to do within the plant by adding more sensors that can be a very valid business case so i don't see that happen um, in our area or at least with our uh, projects yeah okay um, and thank you and um mohammed um yeah. thank you um, for asking lots of questions okay please prafal before you do yeah. uh yeah i can relate to gino's point that asset integrity is a late stage problem and not an early stage problem and that's why the tendency for project managers is to postpone asset integrity discussions. Um, once the project is over, they go, uh, asset integrity becomes someone else's problem. And I think that's what the point is, is being mentioned there. Because sensors, if it is integrated right at the design stage, or construction stage, they bring big value, but often the priorities are different at that point. Okay. okay. Thank you. And um, just quickly going through some of the questions, Mohammed's um, asked a, a number of questions, but um, interestingly, he was talking about being able to have a sensor that can um, provide the corrosion rate, but you also, you, you, why, why can't you have a one sensor that can also uh, help you to detect other um, failures as well and, and provide other information such as iron content and pH and chlorine Oxygen. I mean, what do you, is, is that where you see um, sensors going, Prafel and, and Martin? Prafel? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yes, definitely I see that, that it's not just enough to measure corrosion rate, but also conditions which leads to corrosion. For example, pH, a measurement of that is a predictive tool. Uh, we provide moisture sensor for CY, it's a predictive tool. Uh, um, Uh, I think we might have lost uh, and, and that's where the opportunity of prediction comes in for horizontalization of the industry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Martin? Yeah, James, I think your question was if you see more integrated sensors. Um, if, if I would answer it technically, uh, every sensor, one of the nice things of sensors nowadays is that they have low battery consumption. And um, in order to make that happen, you don't want a sensor which consumes a lot of power. Huh? Um, so I think that could be one of the reasons that uh, we don't see a lot of integration yet. I think the other thing is that we have many little fishes who each focus on one sensor. Uh, maybe once those fishes grow together, uh, we will get more integrated sensors, that could be. The other thing is probably that you do not want to measure uh, everything on the same location. So to have sensors which are separate is a better business case. Uh, these are the things I can I can think of at the moment. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. Thank you. And um, you mentioned battery battery power and, um, and the need to provide power to these systems. Um, someone I think it might have been Mohammed mentioned about 
and the, the so sometimes the the intensity of some of these systems and God to consuming power. Um, Prafal, uh, have you, uh, there, has there been any advancements from your side in battery power? Oh yeah, so five years back again, people would have uh, battery power was a good to have, um, but now we see battery power is a must have. You know, when we deploy new sensors, people who don't want to spend money on creating uh, electrically kind of electrical connections, they are expensive. If we can retrofit the sensors, uh, minimizing the cost overheads, battery power is a given. And the technology is available. Uh, Corrosion Adapt provides that, but uh, other comp IoT companies, you know, battery power is a given. So it is reality now. Okay, thank you. Um, John O'Brien, thanks for your question. I see nothing about the detail and what specific decision you change for an operator. Interesting. Plus the detail on how, where that specifically creates value and the degree of improvement. This is why I stated earlier around digital fatigue is occurring. Lots of spend, but little clear on improvements. Um, well, there's lot, lots of good work going on in this space and uh, Praffel, I think, you know, you might be worth, you mentioned about the balance between risk and cost um, and with inspection intervals. And how, how do you optimize inspections and maintenance? Um, for asset integrity, I think there are three paradigms. One is reactive maintenance. The other is proactive maintenance. So one is reactive is when the problem happens, failure happens, leakage happens. It's too late. Costs are high. The other paradigm is proactive, which is more time-based. So fixed time, at fixed time, you inspect to avoid uh, failures. Now, those are over-inspection. A lot of money gets Okay, I think Prafel, we're, we're, we're losing you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Prafel. I think we we lost you there because your bandwidth. So, um, I think you summarised yeah. in terms of there being over inspection or under inspection. So, if there's um, not the right um, inspection, then obviously that leads to risk and, and, and failures and damage. If there's over inspection, that's obviously increasing costs. Now, how do you how do you optimise inspection so you know exactly where and when? to inspect and maintain and precisely where and when is, is, is really where we see there being um, incremental improvements and, and gains from a CUI management perspective. Um, so anything you'd like to add on that, Martin? Uh, well, I think in general, uh, also what I mentioned before, you always have to look at the business case. What value does it bring to you? I think in, in the data case, it was very obvious. Yeah? Uh, but that's part, I think, what, what our customers have to, to um, discuss with us as well uh, because if you don't do that you get this fatigue yeah but okay, I, I, I strongly believe that uh, in the near future many plants will have uh, much more sensors than we have now okay excellent thank you and there's lots of questions around um, I think maybe um, both to you Martin and Praffle in terms of um, the temperature ranges for you, the sensors that um, you um, provide and the the accuracy of the sensors so feel free, please, to contact Yokogara or Corrosion Radar about that. I'm sure you know, there's another opportunity to go into detail around that. Um, but one person, I think, mentioned about, I think this was already asked, but what, what's Yokogara doing about CUI? Because obviously there's a lot of people in the audience who have a problem with CUI. So Martin, yeah, what are you doing okay. about it? Yeah, a good question. Um... Um, when we present our joint ecosystem, we present it as an ecosystem, eh? like basically um, it covers everything or if you have other apps you want to connect, that's possible as well. Um, but at the same time, we see in this market that a lot of uh, people are looking for particular solutions. So maybe corrosion radar sensor or maybe a manual hand valve positioner or maybe vibration uh, uh, rotating asset detection, uh, various things. So most things we, we sell at the moment are individual solutions. Yeah? And we see a lot of uh, potential in, in what CR is doing. So that's one of the reasons why we, that's the, the, an important reason why we are partnering up because um, we see a lot of value in that. And, and, okay. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, excellent. So feel free, as I said, there's lots of good questions, but mainly wanting to go in more detail around uh, Yokogara or why did you come up with the name Sushi? <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. And also um, in regards to corrosion radar and, and, and how corrosion radar are helping to detect, predict moisture and corrosion. So um, feel free to contact the, um, those people um, directly. Um, I really wanted to really get across um, today to people who are from the CUI community that you know we do need to look around us and, and look, look outside of our silos to understand within the ecosystem what's going on and how organizations such as Yokogawa are helping um, in regards to addressing the problem of CUI. Um, so Martin, thank you for that. I think it's been really insightful and for Praffle to bring that perspective from a CUI um, point of view. And um, you know, I think we've, we've achieved this in terms of really getting us to think differently and look at how digitalization can evolve us as people um, and our roles. Um, so let's end the um, session because we're over one hour, um, but we will get back to everyone in regards to the questions because there's plenty of other questions which we've not had time to, to answer. So let's wrap up the call in terms of, um, I really appreciate, um, everyone joining and uh, we will be hosting another session at the start of the new year so i'd like to wish you all um, a nice break over the the rest of december and into the new year and uh, we'll be there's plenty of other interesting organizations are looking at cui from from their perspective whether it's iot or um, analytics and we'll be um, introducing those companies to you uh, in in january so Look forward to speaking to you all again and we'll get back to you in regards to the questions that we haven't answered. So thank you very much and I wish you a great day, evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.